In Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 3, we read familiar words in verses 16 and 17. And although I'm going to repeat them here today, we're not going to base the rest of the message on these verses, but use them as a launching pad to go elsewhere in Scripture. But let's read the Word of God. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the Word of God. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. What we have in the text before us, beginning in verse 16, is a declaration, a statement, a word about the extent, no, not the extent of Scripture, but about the nature of Scripture. This is not saying I'm only talking of the Old Testament, which really at that time was the only Scripture that was penned up to this point when Paul wrote to Timothy. But if you look at the text, it's talking about the, the nature of Scripture. All Scripture is. In other words, wherever you find Scripture, this is what you're going to find. You're going to find something that's breathed out by God. Theopneustos is the Greek term. It does not mean to inspire. It means to expire. God has breathed out His Word. What I want to deal with today is the fact that God has preserved His Word. I remember entering a seminary, Bible seminary in England and thinking that uh, I hope that I'll come out the other side believing that the Bible is the Word of God. Many of you might know of those who've entered such places of academia and they've lost their faith, so-called. They've been told to examine certain books and certain writings that are against the idea that God has spoken, and you fill your mind with that eight hours every day, after every day, after every day, for two, three, four years. It's hard to come out the other side believing the Bible is the Word of God. I know of many who've gone down that road, and because of the challenges that they face, and not hearing the other side, and there is another side, about why we can believe the Bible is the Word of God, some have had their faith shipwreck. We have before us, in front of us, or on our phones, a 66 book canon of Scripture. The word canon is spelt with one N rather than two. It's not talking about uh, the firing of missiles. It's talking about a rule. The word canon means rule and we as Christians and Protestant Christians affirm a 66 book canon of the Bible. By that there are 66 books that God has inspired that we've come to understand. 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, a total of 66. The 39 Old Testament books in our Protestant Bibles correspond to the exact same books in the Hebrew Bible. I brought with me the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, it's interesting, it's all in Hebrew. There is some help for people like me with English alongside, but it reads from right to left rather than left to right, and many have never seen a Tanakh. But that would be the Hebrew Scriptures, and it's the exact same Old Testament that we have. They would not call it the Old Testament. I remember um, a, a man going into a Jewish bookstore and naively asking the shop attendants, um, if he could uh, be given or could he have access to an Old Testament. 
and the, the smiling, understanding shop assistant said, uh, how old, sir? <laughs> They have not yet recognized as a New Testament. So that was uh, very, very interesting to me when I heard that. In fact, uh, what I brought with me is uh, also the Greek New Testament. Um, and uh, we'll talk more about that in a moment. But it's great to know that what we have in our Bibles, Protestant Bibles, are the exact same books that the Hebrews understood to be Scripture. There's much in the way of resource regarding material available as to why we believe the right books made it into our Bibles. Uh, there's two I'd recognize as very helpful. The Question of Canon by Michael J. Kruger and a second one by the same author, Canon Revisited. Very, very helpful. Wonderful resources. But let me go further today and recognizing that you've come to a church service rather than a seminary and you haven't signed up for a 38-week course on the subject. We've just got one attempt to cover the bases in this. The big picture here, although we could spend a lot of time looking at each individual book of our Bibles and seeing the divine, sovereign uh, attestation that this is in fact God speaking to us, <clears throat> the big picture is we believe the 39 books of the Old Testament because the Lord Jesus affirmed these books. When it comes to these books, Jesus affirmed them. A study of the Gospels shows us that he had the highest view of Scripture. In Matthew 5, 17, he said this, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. This is even more significant than saying the dotting of the I or the crossing of the T. These were little marks on the page in the original language which gave indication as the right way to interpret the word that is assigned to those marks. And Jesus said there's not even the smallest yod in Hebrew. There's not even the smallest mark on the page that will pass from the law till everything is accomplished. Jesus had the highest view. In fact, he believed when you and I are reading the Old Covenant, God is speaking to us. I'd like to quote from my second book called The Five Solas. I wrote this, This extremely high view of Scripture is the one clearly embraced by Jesus himself. When answering a question posed to him by the Sadducees concerning the resurrection, Jesus quoted a passage in the book of Exodus. In doing so, he said this, this is Matthew 22, verse 31, Have you not read what was said to you by God? Let me say those words again, the words of Jesus. Quoting the book of Exodus, Have you not read what was said to you by God? Without getting caught up in the details of the answer given here, we can glean much from these words spoken from the lips of Jesus, especially when we recognize exactly what was taking place at that moment. Think about this. Jesus was speaking to people alive in his day, the Sadducees, many generations after the book of Exodus was written. To these people... In just so many words, he was saying, when you read a passage in Exodus, though written many centuries before, and originally said to a people of a different age, God is speaking to you. In this passage, Jesus made it clear that the Sadducees were very much responsible for their own errors in doctrine. They couldn't le legitimately claim ignorance on the matter because God had clearly spoken to them in his word. And what's true concerning the book of Exodus is, by extension, also true concerning all of sacred scripture. The Bible is God speaking to us. I, would, I wonder if you can affirm that out loud today. Would you say this after me if you believe this? The Bible is God speaking to me. Let's say that. The Bible is God speaking to me. There's an objection to this. Uh, maybe uh, you've heard of liberal scholarship and uh, there in the theological realm it's those that have no real belief in either a miraculous God or a God who can communicate, certainly what, not believing that God has given us his word. And they would say as an objection, well, Jesus was human 
and uh, he was a child of his day. And uh, everyone believed this silly notion of the uh, high view of Scripture in that day. We've moved on from then, right? How do we answer that? Well, we do in fact agree. Jesus was human, but he's also divine. And the Bible, if the Bible is not the Word of God, as God, Jesus would have known that. And so to affirm something that he knew was untrue is to lie. And that would actually strike a fatal blow concerning not the knowledge of Jesus, but the sinlessness of Jesus. It's because of our view of Jesus that we go to him and ask of him, what is his view of the scripture? And it's the highest view. And if he knew it wasn't the word of God, but said that it was, that would strike a blow at his holiness. We believe the Old Testament because Jesus did. Do you know Paul did as well? This is not news, but it's good to read of it. Romans 3, let me read this. Verse 1. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect, first of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. Both Jesus and the Apostle Paul believed that God had spoken to the Jewish people in and through and by the Scriptures. He had entrusted them with the oracles, the utterances of God. It wasn't as if Jesus came on the scene and said, you know, you missed three books. There's three books you missed as the Jews. No, he affirmed the writings, the Psalms, the prophets. He actually affirmed the Old Testament and Paul went along with that. God gave the oracles of God to Israel. The first century Jews did not, and I repeat that, did not consider the apocryphal books to be the Word of God. Those who have seen a Roman Catholic Bible see that it's a lot thicker than our Protestant Bibles and they contain the books of the Apocrypha. Jesus never cited them and neither did the Apostles cite them as Scripture. They were seen in the Jewish community as edifying but never authoritative. And they were never included in the Old Covenant canon of Scripture. Concerning the New Testament, let me quote Nathan Buzanitz, who writes this, Our Lord not only affirmed the Jewish canon of the Old Testament, He also promised to give additional revelation to His church through His authorized representatives, namely the Apostles. Jesus made this point explicitly in John 14 through 16. On the night before His death, Jesus said to His disciples, These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the Helper... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he'll teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. The last line is essential for the doctrine of canonicity. Dr. Buzanitz continues, Jesus promised the apostles that the Holy Spirit would help them remember all that he said to them. That's an amazing promise, the fulfillment of which is found in the four gospel accounts, where the things that our Lord did and said are perfectly recorded. Two chapters later, in the same context, the Lord promised the apostles that he'd give them additional revelation through the Holy Spirit. John 16, 12, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he... The Spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all the truth. He'll not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he'll speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. So, where is, that's the end of the quote, where is that uh, understanding and revelation found? It's found in the epistles in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit guided the apostles of Christ in the truth. So, Lot is on our side. The Gospels, Matthew and John, both written by apostles. The Gospel of Mark, uh, really many believe, most believe, all scholarship really believe that Mark is really the memoirs of the Apostle Peter, written by Mark under Peter's uh, direction. The Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts were the result of uh, great investigation and eyewitness testimony which included apostolic sources and uh, again in the early church was well recognized as being uh, scripture. The Pauline apost uh, uh, epistles, Peter even writes in 2 Peter 3 calling Paul's writings scripture and so it goes on. 
book of Revelation written by John, Jude written by the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, so, so we go on. Every book of the New Testament came with apostolic authority either by an apostle or someone linked to the apostle's ministry, the apostolic ministry. And so that's exactly a fulfillment of what Jesus said would happen. So, why these 66 books? Well, because God inspired them. And his sheep hear his voice. I remember hearing the testimony of my fellow elder Doug. And uh, he read John chapter 1 one time. And just recognized it as the voice of God to his soul. In a way that reading Shakespeare never could. Reading some of the greats of antiquity never could. There's something that the sheep of God recognize in the voice of the Lord in the scripture. So, we could spend a lot of time on that and I'm going as fast as I can to get through this because there's other things we need to get to. We've got the Bible, we've got the right 66 books. I believe the Lord has guided the church providentially to know what was of Him and what was not. But let's talk about the transmission of the text. That's a completely different subject. Okay, we might have the right books, but how do we know that what they wrote is what we now have? You ever ask that question? Is what we see and read now, what Peter wrote then, what John wrote then. Here's what we believe. And if we understand this, it's very, very helpful. We believe in the inspiration of the original writings of either the prophets or the apostles, of David or of Luke. And we have a theological term for those original writings. They're called the autographs. These were the original writings. When Paul wrote Romans, there was one original. There's been many, many copies ever since. But it was the original that was inspired. How many of you, let me ask you this, you don't need to raise a hand or anything, have had the task, either at school or since then, of seeing a passage and given the task of reproducing it without a photocopier, without a scanner. Just, I know it seems so archaic but getting a pen and writing down what you've seen and the text before you. How many have ever done that? Okay, I'd ask you not to raise your hand now. I've asked you to raise your hand. Okay, I'm a contradiction, I understand. You, you don't know what to do with your hands, but <laughs> there you go. That task is a lot harder than we, we thought it would be. You've got maybe eight, nine, ten lines to write. You think this will be a cinch, real easy. And you realize that when you look back at the original and then you look at your copy, you realize, oh, I've said this word twice. I've said the word that twice. And it's, you know, I've actually missed an entire line out here. And you look and you're appalled. And that's under air conditioning with great light. And we can still make mistakes. And so when we look back in time and see mistakes in the copies, people think, oh, there's mistakes in the copy. Look, we expect that. No one ever believed that the copies would be inspired, just the original autographs. Make sense? And so when you find three different spellings of the name of David, don't be upset. People didn't know how to spell sometimes. And so it was, David, David, with many two E's, and David, you know, and, and you think, well, they're from a region that never heard the name David, and they're writing David, and they, they well, I, they make mistakes. But these are not mistakes that uh, cause people to go to hell because they're uh, re uh, th 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 they're, they're bringing new theology to the text. They're just a spelling errors. Most of the manuscript differences are spelling errors. Most. But it's the autographs that were inspired. There are manuscript errors. What do we find in the Old Testament? The Old Testament Jews were beyond meticulous. Do you know when you have scribes, and these are professional guys who, okay, they don't have uh, air conditioning or great lighting, but with the light available to them, their task is to reproduce, say, the book of Deuteronomy. And they will spend all day, every day, working on it. In fact, oftentimes it's the entire first five books of Moses that were in view. And before they ever came to write the name of God, Yahweh, they would take a bath. And then they would write the name of God. And guess what? Afterwards, 
they would take a bath. <laughs> Imagine that. Uh, three, four, five times you see the name of God in a chapter. These were very clean people. Very, very clean. But they had such a hallowed sense of what they were dealing with that they gave themselves to the copying with absolute integrity and absolute energy so that we look back and we're amazed by it. In the Hebrew uh, papyri, when a copy was to be made, you've got the original copy of Moses, which has long since rotted somewhere, but we have copies. Do you know, every Hebrew letter has a numerical value. We don't have that in English. We write letters and we write numbers. But some of you know that it's not an unknown thing for the letters of a language to also represent numbers. And that's true in the Hebrew. And you can count how many letters are on a line and add up the numbers that should be there as you total that thing up. And when you come to the copy, say there are 439 on a particular line the, in the original, there should be 439 in the numerical value in the copy. And then what they would do would be to cut to add up all of the numbers of all the letters on their particular papyri, write the number down. If it did not match the original, even if they'd spent 18 hours on the thing, they would burn it. That's how meticulous they were. When papyrus, which didn't last forever, came to be so worn it couldn't be used anymore, they would first make uh, exact copies and then bury the original in the desert, in the ground. And so, so meticulous was this that our findings in antiquity really show us just how true to the original these copies were. For instance, in 1947, in a cave in a place called Qumran in the Middle East, a shepherd boy found what we now know as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Ever heard of those? Dead Sea Scrolls. And what this was, was not a treasure of jewelry, but a treasury of papyrus. And uh, they were able to find uh, almost the entire Old Testament in jars that have been very, very well preserved. There's a complete uh, book of Isaiah. And what this did was allow us to go a thousand years, about a thousand years back in time to a time when people were copying. And so rather than our knowledge of Isaiah being a thousand years later, we were able to go back a thousand years and find, comparing it with what we have today, the amount of errors was so minuscule that scholars are still aghast at the absolute ability of these scribes to translate correctly. Absolutely amazing. Much of the Old Testament discovered, as I say, including the whole book of Isaiah. Amazing transmission of the text. And so we can look at our Old Testament and know what we have is what Moses wrote. What we have is very, very, very encouraging. The more you look into it, the more your faith will be enlarged rather than depleted. When we come to the New Testament, it was written not in Hebrew as the old was, but in Greek. It was written in something called Koine Greek, which is common Greek. Uh, Alexander the Great in the province, providence of God. By the way, what a great family, Alexander the Great. I wouldn't like to be his brother, would you? you know, Malcolm the Average. <laughs> Brian the Mediocre. Alexander the Great. Well, he conquered the known world and he insisted that everywhere he conquered they would speak Greek. How fortuitous that when the gospel was about to go nationwide and worldwide, there was a ready audience in Greek for the entire known world to hear the gospel. It was common Greek. It was not some lofty Greek that only the elite knew. It was common, koine Greek. And that's what we learn in our Bible seminaries today. Koine Greek rather than modern Greek. And God has preserved His Word. This is what I want you to... To, to grasp today. God has preserved His Word incredibly, breathtakingly, in ways that will stun us. How? By the explosion of thousands and thousands of manuscripts. We have about 25,000 manuscripts of the New Testament in Koine Greek. 
and they've been scattered throughout uh, Europe and the world and all of this is a gift to the church. Why is it a gift? Because there were so many. Okay, so why is that a, a gift? Because they were scattered. Oh, okay, well, why is that a gift? It's a gift because not one person, whether he was an emperor or a king or one group, could contain it. They can't say, look, let's get the 20 manuscripts out there of the New Testament and let's change it. Let's put in, I know, the deity of Christ. Yeah, and then we'll get, you know, I'd rather they worship me, of course, but failing that, they're not going to worship me. Let's all get them unified in worshipping the one thing and we'll get peace in the empire. Let, let, let's, put, let's insert Jesus is God. Oh yeah, the word was God. That'll sound good. Yeah, they'll believe that. Because there was an explosion. Listen, listen. the Christians were under persecution. The Christians were being either killed or severely under duress. And so getting a copy of the, say, the Gospel of Matthew could be a death sentence. And so people under the dark canopy of night would get hold of it and they'd, they'd hear the news that the Gospel of Matthew is coming to our village. Really? The Gospel of Matthew? I, I read John once. Matthew's coming? Wow. Uh, who's got it first? Well, Clive and Jane, they've got it first. But, but you're, you're number three in the list. Well, how long can I have it? Uh, three days. Three days, okay. And for those three days, okay, Brian, please copy chapter two, three, four. Uh, uh, Cindy, can you do six, seven, eight? Okay, okay, we've got three days. And then you're busy writing this out, copying it out, but when your three days is up, you've got... Did we get all of Matthew? Yes, we got all of Matthew. Are there mistakes? Yes. But you've got the teachings of Jesus in your household. And guess what? This went on and on and on and on. And so families all through the village and then the town and then the empire, I mean the entire empire, got hold of the scriptures in this way so that manuscripts were absolutely every. No king to say, bring them all to me. I'd like to make some changes. He couldn't. It was everywhere. It was an explosion, and that was God's providence, so that in the 21st century we can say, no man has tampered with the text to insert false doctrine or new doctrines. That excites me. Because if it just was one little thing that came down from heaven, here's the New Testament, you know, you can say, okay, uh, Clive, uh, look over there, and then whoosh, you make some changes. <laughs> but because of God's providence, no one could do that. There's a book I recommend, The King James Only Controversy by James White. There's a new book called Authorized, The Use and Misuse of the King James Bible by Mark Ward. Uh, many of you might have heard of these guys. They're out there. The King James Only people. What are these? These are not worshippers of uh, a guy called James. These are people that believe that only the King James Version is inspired that God might have, well, he might have uh, inspired the Hebrew and the Greek, but in 1611, God, in his grace, inspired a new version. Well, here's what we need to differentiate between, and that is those who are King James preferred and those who are King James only. If someone say, you know, of the Bibles out there, I prefer the King James, I've got no issue with that. I love the King James. I grew up on the King James. Lazarus come forth and it sufficeth me and all of that. And, and um, he who so ordereth his conversation aright, will I show the salvation of God? Great, uh, great lyrics and it's very easy to memorize. I, I love the King James. But where there's an issue is when people say it's the only one and they actually split churches and split families by saying, you read the NIV and you're of the devil. You're re reading a devilish interpretation or translation. Their understanding is this. The King James Bible alone is the Word of God alone. That's their starting point. And it's no use. I've talked with them. They're, they're online. You, you need to kind of just avoid them in the end. They will not reason or use reason. They believe that there's a new, inerrant, inspired text, the King James Version. And so an attack on the King James Version is an attack on the Bible. And therefore you are a heretic in their eyes. 
They wreak havoc. Have you ever heard this? They wreak havoc. Have you ever heard this? There's verses missing in the modern translations. You ever heard that? Okay, let's see one. Let's, let's go to uh, John chapter 5. I will ask you to hold hands up at this point. Uh, have any of you got access to the NIV right now? Or the ESV? Great. John chapter 5. I'd like you, when you found it, to look at verse 4. And someone with the NIV. Could you read verse 4 out aloud, please? There isn't one. Uh oh. What's that? It says. It says nothing. Right. It just goes from verse 3 to verse 5, right? Hmm. You ever seen that before? <laughs> it's good to talk about it here rather than out there with an atheist or agnostic. And See? Whoa! Now find, find out about it here. You know, it's missing in the NIV, it's missing in the ESV, but there are footnotes, right? And if you go to either the side margin or at the base of the text, it will explain that the verse four in the in the chapter was not part of the original it was added later what do we do with the in the NASB well it's in brackets do you see that in fact in verse 3 it says in these lay a multitude of those who were sick blind lame and withered brackets waiting for the moving of the waters for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water whoever then first after stirring up the water stepped in and was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted close brackets and what we have here is a scribe who was seeking to be helpful he was not satanic in any way he was trying to help people who'd be reading the text who would have no idea what they were reading about, about uh, Hebrew, Bethesda, uh, the, 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 the pool there, the sheep gate, that have no real knowledge. And so he thought it would be helpful to add a word of commentary. Now, when people saw this in their copy, they thought, well, is this, it's hard to see, is this, is this commentary by a scribe or is it, is it the original wording? It's hard to know. And so their tendency was not to leave anything out, but to put it in. They thought, I don't know. It, it, it could be in the margin. It looks like it's different, but I, I, I'm not going to take the chance. It's not part of the original. I'm going to put it in. Later on, centuries later, when we find a Greek text that has it in, they then put it into their Bibles, and then they make chapter and verse divisions, and there's verse 3, there's verse 4, there's verse 5, and then scholarship comes along and says, hey, ho, hey, time out. When we go back, that little phrase wasn't there for the first 1,300, 1,400 years of the church, but one very helpful scribe thought he'd help us by putting it in. We need to just make, make it clear. It's not part of the original. It's not part of the original. But what we'll do, we'll put it in, but we'll put brackets around it, or else we'll leave it out and explain why in the footnotes. That's exactly what's... There was no satanic conspiracy. Sorry. All you can... Uh, and ideas of the devil. No, no, no. It was... It was if, they, if it was a devilish work, they didn't do a very good job because they supplied footnotes. <laughs> and if you just read down a little bit, you've got the words if you want them. I mean, if you're going to have a conspiracy and hide something, that's not hiding it very well. Hide it somewhere in another book somewhere. They're not right there at next to the actual verse. <laughs> what we have, and what I brought with me, brought from my study at home, are two different Greek sources. One is called the Textus Receptus. Ever heard of that? It means in English the received text. I'll talk about that in a moment. The other is the Nestle or Nestle Aland uh, Greek New Testament. And uh, it's this black one, the received text, that the King James Version is based on. And I would say 
in 1611, around that time, compared to what we know now in terms of manuscript discovery, there was far, 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 far less to go on when the received text was introduced by those in that time. Far less. And so it's actually inferior to this, the Nestle Aland one, because uh, there's people like Dan Wallace who are roaming the earth hearing of a new Greek text available and he goes with the most uh, expensive kind of photography equipment possible and, and takes a look at the Greek text and compares it with the thousands he already has and it just adds to our knowledge and that's what's happening in our day. But what the received text is, is the basis for the King James Version and later, how many have heard of this? The New King James Version. It's based on this text. And there are problems with it. I once asked James White in a, a time with him, um, what do you think of the New Kings, King James Version? Um, I had it in my hand at the time and he said, it's an amazing, wonderful translation of an inferior Greek text. If you can follow that, it really is helpful. That's what it is. The received text. It sounds like it's authoritative, right? The received text. We receive this as coming from God. The received text. Actually, no council in church history ever said this. This is the received text. It was actually an advertising device by two brothers called the Elsevier brothers in 1633. They wanted to sell their text, so they called it the received text. It's like a Hebrew shop owner I heard of who was sandwiched between two large mega stores. Everyone was going to the two stores rather than his, so he thought of a good name to get people to go to his store. He called his store Entrance. <laughs> so it is. To call it the received text sounds like, doesn't it sound like Everybody, everybody's receiving this. This is it. Well, it was an advertising ploy. That's what it is. But the Nestle Alon text is based on vast scholarship far beyond what was available in the 15th and 16th centuries. And guess what? Here's what I want to emphasize. Though there are minor differences at some points, these two teach the exact same doctrines and theology. But one's inferior to the other. The King James, based on this, the other translations like the NIV. Uh, the NIV has been scandalous. You know, you read of this, they'll, they'll show you, they've got these charts, these guys, and they say, look, in the King James Version, it says, the Lord Jesus Christ in this verse. And you go to the NIV and it says, Jesus Christ. It misses out the word Lord. You see, the translators of the NIV were satanically inspired. They don't believe in the Lordship of Jesus. Burn the thing. Now what it is, is when you're making a copy, you have a tendency to remember how that phrase should be in your mind and you look at the text but you're still remembering in your mind his full title is Lord Jesus Christ and I see Jesus Christ in the text but I'll insert the word Lord because I know that's what it's talking about and that's what's happening and that's what did happen in the Textus Receptus and guess what if the if the Nestle Allen people and the NIV were wanting to get the Lordship of Christ out of the Scriptures, they did a very poor job. Because you read four verses down and it says, Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, if, go if you're going to be, if you're going to rob a bank, at least show up at the bank, you know? <laughs> if you're going to do something really hideous, be good at it. You know, think it through. Don't put Lord Jesus Christ four more verses down. That doesn't appear on the King James only charts, but it's there in the NIV. The NIV is a great translation. Sometimes it's more thought for thought. 
than word for word. But let me tell you this, all translations have to make editorial decisions on how to interpret and translate a certain word. For instance, in German, this, I did a little German, I knew a little German, he was four foot two. Um, I know a little Greek and um, he owns a restaurant. <laughs> in, in, um, in German, <clears throat> the word for glove is Handschuhe. It's two words sand, uh, sandwiched together, you can guess what they are, shoes and hand. And so a glove in German is a shoe for the hand. We don't think that way, but that's how you say it in German. Handschuhe. Okay? How do you translate that when you come over to English? You read the word Handschuhe. Do you, in, in, do you translate it literally? Well, that's a, that, that's a hard word to use, literally, because are you wanting to convey the meaning of the word? The NIV goes for the meaning of the word, the NASB would say, shoes for the hand. <laughs> but the NIV would say, gloves, because that's the word we all know. Do you see, you've got to make an editorial decision there. Not that one is wrong and one is really right, but it's a difference of attitude of what we want you to do. We want a million people to understand it, or three people <laughs> to understand what shoes for the hand really are. They mean gloves. Okay, that's the word we use. I've never ever said to anyone, Have you, I'm going to do some gardening, have you seen my shoes for the hand? <laughs> Let's go to John and we'll wrap this up. John chapter 7. We're going verse by verse through the Gospel of John. We've come to the end of chapter 7. And guess what we hit? in the NASB, some brackets. <laughs> oh, this is like a truck coming down the road for a preacher. You know it's coming. I knew at chapter 1 that chapter 8 was coming. There's no avoiding it. It's coming. This chapter is coming and there will be a day when you've got to do all of this explanation. <clears throat> so I've been praying for this for about a year. <laughs> We're about message 50 in the series on the Gospel of John. Here we are. Look at verse 52 of John 7. They answered him, You are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. Verse 53. Brackets. Everyone went to his home. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And it goes on. Verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6. All the way to verse 11 where there's the end of the brackets. Oh my goodness. The entire story of the woman caught in adultery is in brackets. We're not talking about a little few words here. This is an entire story. Again, I asked James White what he thought about it. You know, you talk to him and then you don't need to go anywhere else usually. He knows what he's talking about. He says, it's my favorite story that's not in the Bible. <laughs> but it's in our Bibles. It's in our Bibles. Yes, but it's in brackets. Why is it in brackets? Because it wasn't in the original. There are three major portions of the New Testament that were not in the original. I want to believe the original. How about you? I want to know what the I want to know what John wrote. Amen. I want to know what he wrote. And it's interesting. You read some of the commentaries, and they say, "Well, it's it's it was probably not in the original, but there's great truth in it." Yeah, probably there's nothing that's in here that's wrong. In fact, it's an edifying story. I just don't believe it's part of the original. Three major portions. John 7, verse 53 to 8 and 11. We've just looked at it. The ending of Mark 16. Many of you know that. They shall uh, tread upon scorpions. If they eat anything deadly, it shall not hurt them. Very hard to find that in, uh, in an original form. And then in 1 John 5, 7 and 8, we have the comma Johannum, which is an overzealous uh, scribe who's adding some words there to prove the Trinity with one verse. That's what's going on there. And it's clear. There's no knowledge of it until about the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th century. Some scribe says, oh, you know, I, I just, these, these, these Aryans, they're out there still. They, they don't believe in the deity of Christ and the Trinity. And let, let's just, just nail them with one verse. He was an overzealous scribe. 
That's all it is. But knowing that, you come to 1 John 5, 7 and 8 in the NIV and the NASB. It just writes out what was in the original because it's based on this rather than that. And the that has it and the this doesn't have it. Does that make sense? And no scripture doctrine is in any way impacted by these three portions of scripture. I would like you, when you're reading the Bible, to pay more attention now to the footnotes. Are you encouraged to do that? Yeah. You see, what I want to be able to do is what I do every Sunday, God helping me, is to say this. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Word of God. And then what comes out of my mouth is what God has spoken. And because I cannot do that on John 7, verse 53, to chapter 8, verse 11, the next time I do that will be at John chapter 8 and verse 12. I just lost half the church there, but Eric's still with me. Praise the Lord. <laughs> James White writes this in his book, the evidence against this particular passage is extensive and wide-ranging, including both external and internal elements. Externally, we note that the passage is omitted by a truly diverse group of ancient manuscripts, and he just lists them, on and on they go. The majority of lectionaries, Latin versions, Syriac versions, then he explains both A and C uh, don't contain it, most probably don't contain it, though both are defective in this section of John and hence cannot be considered directly, consulted directly. Other manuscripts that do contain the passage mark it off with asterisks or something else. This amount of evidence alone would be sufficient, but there's more. The manuscripts that contain the passage normally have it after John 7.42. However, in one manuscript it's found after 736 and in others after 744, in a group of others after John 21, 25. And in one pa uh, manuscript it's not even found in John but in Luke 21, verse 38. Such moving about by a body of text is strong evidence of its later origin and the attempt by scribes to find a place where it fits. Such is not the e earmark of an original gospel passage. He goes on and he says more. Let me read to you, because I thought, you know, others have gone through John. Others have gone and seen this truck coming down the road. Let's see what they did. I came across a sermon by Dr. John MacArthur. He was teaching through the Gospel of John. And uh, he uh, said this. In fact, this is a transcript of his sermon. So it's going to sound like he's uh, giving a sermon rather than he's prepared a, a, a written statement. Are you ready? Here we go. We're going to end with this. Open your Bible now to the 8th chapter of the Gospel of John. It's been a profound blessing in my own life to be preparing these messages in the Gospel of John and spend time in its truth. And at the same time, it's a challenge to articulate for you what has been embedded in my own heart. So I always ask for the Lord's help in delivering the truth. We come in coming... That's why I'm saying it's a sermon. And we, we come in coming to chapter 8 to a familiar story, the story of Jesus and the woman taken in adultery. And the very familiar line, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And at this particular point, I face a decision, which I've already made, and I'll explain. This familiar story, which actually embraces the last verse in chapter 7, the one that says everyone went to his own home, this familiar story does not appear in the oldest manuscripts of the New Testament. It does not appear in any of them at all. Manuscript study is very important to guaranteeing the truthfulness of the text. There are about 25,000 New Testament manuscripts, ancient manuscripts. The oldest of those uniformly do not contain this story. And so you will find in your Bible probably a note in the margin that says later manuscripts added this and that is correct because we have so many manuscripts there's really little doubt that this was added later if something isn't in the oldest and shows up later obviously it was added there's nothing in this story that is unchristlike or unlike the behavior of Jesus. There's really nothing in the story that's unlike the behavior of the religious leaders. It's a wonderful story of forgiveness. 
very likely something like this happened and was passed down orally from person to person to person and eventually someone decided that the story ought to find its way into the New Testament even though it wasn't in the original. So they put it there. In most old manuscripts it's placed here. But sometimes in old manuscripts we find it somewhere else in the Gospel of John and we even find it sometimes in the Gospel of Luke. So apparently it was a story that floated around that somebody decided should find its way into the New Testament. The problem with that is the church from its earliest years has known it didn't belong there. In fact, if you're looking for ancient commentaries on this story written by church fathers and leaders, you won't find one until the 12th century. And even when you start to find the commentary in the 12th century, the notation is made that this doesn't appear in the earliest manuscripts. Why is it here? Because someone put it in. Why is it in your Bible now? Because once it's found its way in, it's become traditionally a part of Scripture and apparently Bible translators are unwilling to remove it, so they just put a notation. I'm happy to tell you that when this does happen, as it happens here, and it happened also at the end of Mark, there is a similar addition to the Gospel of Mark in the 16th chapter from verse 9 on. I'm happy to tell you, we know they are additions because we have those ancient manuscripts. Consequently, we know that the Holy Spirit has then enabled us to preserve the true text. I've written some notes about this story in the Study Bible footnotes, that's his own. I've written something about this in the commentary on John in deference to people who'd be interested in some kind of an interpretation. But the problem is if it didn't appear in the original text, then it's not inerrant. There's no guarantee that it's accurate. There's no guarantee that it's without error, like every other part of Scripture. Furthermore, it interrupts the story that's going on here. I guess you could call this internal evidence. It interrupts the story. We're at this point starting in chapter 7 with Jesus at the Feast of Tabernacles. It lasted a week in the fall of his final year, six months from the cross, and we've been going through the events when he arrived in the middle of the week, went to the temple and began to teach. What follows this story in verse 12 is part of the ministry that Jesus had during the Feast of Tabernacles. So, this interprets those events in the obvious sequence. It should go from verse 52 to chapter 7, immediately to verse 12 of chapter 8. So that's what we're going to do this morning. Let me begin reading in verse 12. By the way, for a more extensive explanation of that, you can check the MacArthur commentary on John or any other commentary for that matter. Let's begin in verse 12. That's what he did with his congregation. And that's what I'm going to do next time we're together. But let me just say this as we wrap up. I want to be able to say, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Word of God. This is the word you can stand on. This is the word you can stake your life on. This is the word that tells you with absolute authority who our God is, who the Lord Jesus Christ is, what the way of salvation is, what the way of obedience looks like. This is the word of God. And when we put our feet on the word of God, we've got the strongest, strongest foundation. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will never pass away. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the fact that scripture, all of it, is God-breathed. Help us to believe and obey it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.